On the 29th of July, the European Union agreed on a deal with Azerbaijan to double oil exports by 2027. The EU seems to have quickly forgotten about Azerbaijan's victorious 44-day campaign, offensive campaign against Armenia. To reclaim land they consider to be theirs, lost in the early 1990s. Politics aside, this military campaign from Azerbaijan was a masterpiece. With striking images overflowing social media of Turkish-built Bayraktar TB2 drones targeting defenseless Armenian vehicles. The 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war is remembered for the role that drone technology has played in determining the outcome of the conflict. However, the true cause behind Azerbaijan's stunning victory is much more complex and can be summarized as exceptional military planning. And many military analysts are convinced that the Azeri army could have put to shame some of Europe's best armies like France, Britain and Germany if they would have faced each other on a similar battlefield. We'll also talk about the crucial role of tanks and armored formations during this war. And before we dive into this, a quick word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play online military vehicle combat game. It's fully cross-platform, so you can play with all your friends whether they use PC, Xbox Series S and X, PlayStation 5 and previous generations. I really appreciate how War Thunder models all its vehicles with over 2,000 historically accurate tanks, helicopters, aircraft and ships that let you participate in battles through more than 100 years of history. Engage in combined arms battles with 50 million other players in 100 maps ranging from World War II to the end of the Cold War. I always tell you but what I like the most about War Thunder is its detailed damage. Forget general hit points. Tanks suffer actual damage to their components and crew instead. A damage x-ray shows exactly what happens to you or your enemy vehicles as they're destroyed or damaged. If you want to get a massive bonus pack including premium account time, free vehicles, boosters and much more, simply click the link in the description below. It's free to play so just try it out. I will see you on the War Thunder battlefield. Preparing for war. Most of Nagorno-Karabakh is mountainous and forested. Armenian militias from the Autonomous Republic of Artsakh fortified a series of hilltops scattered all along the front line. Meanwhile, valleys filled with little villages paved their way through the rocky highlands, which makes Nagorno-Karabakh very easy to defend. A third of the population is concentrated around the capital, Stepanakert itself protected by a ring of fortified hills and villages. The Lachin Corridor that links Nagorno-Karabakh to neighboring Armenia constitute the best defended area by Armenian militias. It is of vital importance because it is through this lifeline that all logistics, military equipment and volunteers from Armenia transit. The roughly 40,000 Armenian militias, both active and reserve components from this Karabakh self-defense force, were mostly commanded by veterans from the first Nagorno-Karabakh war, in which Armenia was victorious. These Armenian officers were convinced of the qualitative superiority of their forces and those of Artsakh militias over their Azeri opponents. The military equipment of the Armenian militia of Nagorno-Karabakh was mostly Soviet, therefore old, but at least they came in great quantity. We're talking about roughly 300 tanks and various armored fighting vehicles, supported by 140 artillery pieces. While Armenia was stuck in some sort of overconfident inertia, Azerbaijan patiently tried to upgrade its aging military to modern standards, with one single goal in mind, reconquer Nagorno-Karabakh. Due to rising oil exports, Azerbaijan became wealthier and could devote the equivalent of 20 billion euros from 2009 to 2018 for their defense with a sharp increase of 60% between 2016 and 2020. Now, instead of wasting their budget on expensive fighter aircraft, they acquired hundreds of drones bought from Israel and Turkey, 100 Russian T-90 tanks, and modernized a lot of its aging T-72s with the help of an Israeli company called Elbit Systems. The T-72s were upgraded with night vision, fire control systems, and much more. But as you can imagine, stacking up modern equipment is not enough to win a war. It is imperative to know how to use all this equipment properly. Turkey essentially trained the Azeri army in how to organize complex NATO-level combined arms operations. 
all the while learning from the recent fighting in Syria and in Donbass. In June 2020, Turkey delivered 10 Bayraktar TB2 drones to Azerbaijan. On top of that, both countries carried out a massive joint exercise carried out in early August 2020. Only a couple weeks before the Azeri offensive. Like some sort of rehearsal. All these factors combined should have worried the Armenian command. Even worse, Armenian authorities should have been alarmed after the four-day fighting in April 2016, which already involved drones, caused the death of 100 Armenian soldiers, and the loss of 14 tanks. Yet the Armenian command stood still. Witnessing this impending threat, Armenian forces could have at least modernized their defenses in Nagorno-Karabakh by building multiple layers of strongholds, strengthening already existing positions with concrete bunkers, setting up underground tunnels to protect them from drones and artillery fire, and increasing the density of minefields to slow down enemy progression. At the same time, Armenia could have improved the camouflage of already existing fortifications, but also built decoy positions to waste precious enemy ammunition. All this could have been done with a reasonably limited budget. However, this would have required an intellectual effort that the Armenian command, that the Armenian political leadership did not want to make. The military campaign, round one. The Azeri offensive was launched on September 27. Its objective was to gain as much ground as possible. So we're talking about a war for territorial conquest. On paper, Armenian and Azeri BTGs, combining tanks, mechanized infantry, and artillery, were quite close in organization, since they both have the same Soviet heritage. However, we can note that generally speaking, Azeri formations were on average equipped with slightly more modern equipment. But the determining factor was that the strike force that Azerbaijan brought to the front was much more numerous, roughly 30 to 40 BTGs against 20 on the Armenian side. Now the Karabakh self-defense force could compensate for this numerical inferiority by relying on their organized defenses. The Azeri strike force was divided in three army corps. The first army corps with six mechanized brigades in the north towards Madagiz and in the center towards Askeran. The second army corps, five mechanized brigades facing the plains of the south towards Fizuli and Goradiz. Lastly, the 5th Army Corps kept in reserve. In the north, Armenian militias were surprised, and two fortresses fell on the first day. Armenian commanders then immediately sent reinforcements by truck, but those were attacked by waves of suicide drones, and the Armenian comms simply dispersed and disbanded. Overestimating Azeri forces, the Armenians simply withdrew from the area. However, the 1st Azeri Army Corps could not progress further because it was slowed down by the difficult terrain. They suffered heavy losses and only managed to get hold of the city of Magadiz after a week. In the center, the results were disappointing. This axis was the shortest towards Tepanakert, around 36 kilometers. Armenia sent one of many mechanized columns forward. Five days later, Armenian troops had held the line, and this mechanized column had suffered heavy losses as well. Five BMPs were set on fire, as well as two T-72s. And the Azeri attackers simply stopped there. Because all this was part of a deception maneuver. Now, the south of Nagorno-Karabakh is rather flat. And logically, this was the main axis of attack for Azerbaijan's mechanized columns. And to make things even more complicated for Armenia, only a few roads lead from Stepanakert down south. Despite all these advantages, this time again the Azeri advance was slow because of multiple Armenian minefields and anti-tank missiles. An Azeri column tried to outflank the Armenians by driving along the border with Iran. This one was forced to abandon 10 BMPs and BTR-82s. Overall, at the end of the first week, it seems as if Azerbaijan's offensive would get bogged down and that the entire operation would end in a fiasco behind enemy lines. While ground forces attempted to push through, deep strikes were carried by Azeri drones, mainly against the Armenian Air Defense Force protecting the sky of Nagorno-Karabakh. The most important targets were the Russian-made Tor and S-300s. However, Armenia did not really have enough of them to fully cover the territory, so they were constantly on the move, redeployed from one area to another. And while in this transport configuration, this is where they're the most vulnerable. For example, this is how a modern Tor SA-15 was neutralized by a TB2 drone. Meanwhile, throughout the war, many S-300s were lost due to strikes by some of the 200 Israeli suicide drones like the Harab. 
Within a week, by October 4th, the Azeri army had claimed the destruction of 33 Armenian anti-air defense systems, including a very expensive S-300. The Oryx side, for its part, documented the destruction of 27 systems and 12 radars. Azerbaijan lined up 600 various artillery pieces, ranging from howitzers, mortars, and MRLS systems that could hit any target in Nagorno-Karabakh, like the Russian-made 2S7 Peon, which sends 203mm shells at a range of 37 km, or the 300mm rockets from the Smirch at 90 km. But all these artillery pieces lacked accuracy. This is where Azerbaijan's fleet of 20 Israeli reconnaissance drones, like the Heron, Hermes 450 and Orbiter 3 intervened, most likely operated by Turkish special forces. The drones guided artillery fire, which made quick work of pre-identified enemy positions. For example, drone images showed Armenian tanks with hull down dugouts, but perfectly visible from the sky. This combination of drone artillery was also destructive against incoming Armenian reserves. Here's another example on the fourth day of the war. Armenian units of the second echelon attempted a counterattack. But the moment they regrouped, drones had spotted them, and Azeri long-range artillery fired at these exposed columns. These strikes paralyzed Armenian forces, and if the videos of kamikaze drones and TB2s showed as if they did the entire work, at least half of Armenia's anti-aircraft defense systems were actually destroyed by artillery to make matters worse for Armenia. Anytime their artillery would engage Azeri troops, they immediately got spotted, and then overwhelmed by Azeri counter-battery fire. During this war, Armenia lost 200 artillery pieces of all types, including 73 MRLS systems, for one MRLS destroyed for Azerbaijan and one mortar. We're talking about a ratio of 1 for 100 in favor of the attacker. And on top of that, Turkish TB2 drones hunted for exposed howitzers and logistic truck convoys. Even though Azerbaijan only had 10 TB2 drones, these attacks also had a major psychological impact. It was reported that by day 5, 1,500 Armenian soldiers had deserted and abandoned their combat positions. And this number would later increase to 10,000, the breakthrough. So let's start on top, in the north. The Azeri 1st Corps simply held on to its conquered positions. After the first week, the 5th Army Corps, kept in reserve, moved south. There were three key points in the southern sector. Fizuli, Hadrut, and Jabrail. All these cities were lightly fortified and controlled the access of valleys leading directly towards the capital, Stepanakert. The 2nd Corps relaunched attacks supported by fresh reserves. And shock units like the Syrian mercenaries. We don't have much detail about their combat operations, but the heavy death toll could lead us to believe that the 2,500 Syrian mercenaries were meant as expendable assault units to go in the first wave across minefields against the strongest enemy positions. Then as a forward observers only had to see where the fire was coming from and then bombarded these areas. 541 Syrian mercenaries would become KIA and using a three wounded for one KIA ratio, 2,164 would become casualties. That's a casualty rate of 86%. Essentially, the entire Syrian core was annihilated. Facing such relentless attacks, Armenian defenses held out for another week before showing signs of cracking. By constantly retreating, Armenians no longer benefited from their entrenched positions. And with no reserves ready to counterattack on strategic positions, the penetrating power of Azeri forces at the tip became exponential. Jabrail was lost on October 4th and Hadrut on October 9th. At this point, Armenia had its legs shaking. The next day, on October 10th, a truce was called up under the mediation of Russia. Humanitarian corridors were set up to evacuate prisoners and wounded. But this time off mainly benefited Azerbaijan. While ground operations were stopped, bombardments did not. So Armenian units that needed replacements, lacked ammunition, lacked supplies, would not be reinforced. Meanwhile, since the Azeris controlled the sky, they used this freedom to reposition their troops and rotated worn-out BTGs with fresh ones. It's as if when you're playing football, your team is not allowed to make any changes, but the other team can bring all the fresh guys from the bench. Combat operations resumed on the 14th of October, and by the 17th, Fezuli was conquered by Azeri forces. And this is when Armenian defenses just collapsed. We also have to talk about the, the great role that tanks played in this breakthrough. While properly supported by infantry, 
Azeri tanks were actually the most useful in urban warfare as they could fire direct shots into Armenian positions, which are hard to target using artillery. The great number of tanks deployed also meant that they could mutually support each other, while Armenia's scattered tanks could oppose very little resistance and had no other choice but to abandon the towns of Jabrail, Hadrut and Fizuli. In only a week, the entire border area with Iran was conquered and the maneuver turned north like a hook towards Shusha, whose outskirts were reached on the 6th of November. The city was extremely strategic because it secured the Lachin Corridor linking Armenia to the Autonomous Republic of Artsakh. Let's go commando, whoops, wrong conversation. Let's talk about Azeri commandos. Following Soviet doctrine, Azeri forces had saboteur units meant to infiltrate deep into enemy lines, blowing up stuff, acting as recon units but also as forward artillery observers. Before the Nagorno-Karabakh war, these few hundred elite soldiers got even more training in Turkey. And this is how, in early November 2020, 400 Azerbaijani special forces marched tens of kilometers on foot through forests towards Shusha for five days. The terrain was really not suitable for vehicles, and the remaining roads were heavily defended by Armenia. They completely surprised the 2,000 Armenian defenders of Shusha. First of all, they blew up a strategic bridge over the Hakari River, which was the only way for Armenia to allow supplies and reinforcements into the city. And then they climbed through an undefended cliffside to get into the city. This is where an urban battle erupted. Armenians claimed that 6,000 Azeris attacked them. The battle was difficult. Azeri special forces faced numerous enemy armored vehicles and they were unable to use their combat drones because of the foggy weather. So they had to manually coordinate artillery fire. And as you can guess, accuracy was very poor. On the Armenian side, a soldier remembers the chaotic defense for Shusha. The Armenian command sent in their last reserves and created a patchwork of loosely organized Armenian volunteers and Karabakh militia units glued together. Out of his 84 men units sent in reinforcement, 60 refused to go into the town. His unit didn't even have maps of the place and had to scout the area by themselves. And during the battle, he had the impression that their artillery wasn't working. But in the end, Azeri forces prevailed. And on November 9th, Shusha was captured. If you get a chance, remember to support the channel by using the link in the description to download War Thunder for free and earn exclusive rewards. End of the war. After Shusha fell, all hope was lost. The road to the capital, Stepanakert, was now open. Thousands of Armenian refugees were flooding the roads. The Karabakh self-defense force had disintegrated. And two days after the battle, the prime minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, announced the signing of a ceasefire agreement with Azerbaijan. And in the end, Armenia was forced to cede roughly three quarters of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. However, the ceasefire came at the right time since Azeri forces had also been bled dry. Azerbaijan stated that 2,853 of its soldiers had been killed during the war, alongside 541 Syrian mercenaries, for a total of 3,394 troops KIA. Using the 3 to 1 ratio, you get 13,576 KIA and wounded, and all this within 44 days. Considering Azerbaijan's land forces are 50,000 strong, most of these casualties were 17 to 19 year old conscripts, but 30% were within the 25 to 27 age range, meaning NCOs and soldiers with 3 to 5 years of military training. Meanwhile, Armenia reported the death of 3,825 servicemen. But the former director of the Armenian National Security Service, Arthur Vanetian, stated that it's actually 5,000 Armenians that were KAA during the war. In terms of equipment, according to visually confirmed losses on both sides, Armenia lost 255 tanks damaged, destroyed or captured, 78 armored fighting vehicles and 737 trucks and vehicles, while Azerbaijan lost 62 tanks, 23 armored fighting vehicles and 76 trucks. This military analysis would be incomplete without talking about politics and the relationship between Russia and Armenia. First of all, one of the main reasons for Armenia's defeat was its unwillingness to send actual Armenian troops to the front instead of leaving the brunt of the fighting to Karabakh conscripts and volunteers. It's also important to note that Russia and Armenia were very close allies until 2018. This is when Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and his nationalist rhetoric became hostile to Russia. Many senior Armenian commanders considered too close to Moscow were fired. Russia made it clear to its Armenian ally that it would defend its territorial integrity 
but he would not intervene in Nagorno-Karabakh. So the door for an all-out offensive by Azerbaijan was wide open. At the same time, Russia did not allow Azerbaijan to become too cocky. Half of Azerbaijan's drones were most likely downed by the possible action of the Russian GPS jammer Krashuha. And it's also very likely that Russia threatened direct military intervention if Azerbaijan did not stop its offensive. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to subscribe to my Patreon or check out my PayPal. The links are in the description.